Welcome everyone. We've got our final week in the Pivoting to Online course and we've got our final discussion here with the delightfully talented Dave Cormier. Dave, last oh, week that's we were chatting, or Tuesday I guess it was, and uh, it was a sad day as we covered all the economic uh, conversations and then someone said at the end, maybe next time do something positive guys. And so so let's try and make that at least a little bit of a focus in the discussion today. So what are you seeing going on that's good in this great uh, onlining? A remarkable number of things, as a matter of fact. Um, so do you want me to do them one at a time and we'll talk about those? Because I have a lot of nice things to say, George. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Take it any way you want. It's not like this is a particularly right. well-scripted conversation. Uh, first thing I want to say is it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you the last few weeks. I'll never let anybody know that, but I've had a really nice time. It's been oh, nice. This, this recording will strangely be aborted. Unfortunately, it's unfortunate it took a pandemic to get us to talk to each other again, but uh, it's been worth it for that. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is people's um, willingness to engage in a conversation around change at a faculty level right now. I've had any number of conversations here and with colleagues at other institutions across North America and Europe uh, and at, no, in, in four or five continents now that I think about it. And in every single case, I hear the same pattern of thought. People are more mad on the front end, but more willing to change. And the last piece, and this comes from some research a colleague of mine has done in Europe, people are saying increasingly in the interviews that he's doing, people are thinking they're not going back to the classroom, the same people that they're actually going to take this change with. them. So mm -hmm. do you think that's a likely, are you willing to take, buy into that optimism? I, uh, well, yours. yes, because, and I, I mean, I've long felt that the best time to promote change is when change is happening. It's much harder to move an object than it is to redirect an object. And, or to at least to get the original movement going. So I, I agree with you. Um, I think there are things that people who've been early on in using technology in classrooms and have played with a number of these waves of tools that we've seen come in, sort of from early collaborative opportunities to just tools that give students control. And we had this really early on in the course. I remember at the conversation the interview I had with Bonnie really early in this course. Um, and she talked about the power aspects of the class environment, you know, from both an equity and from also a student control perspective. And that's worth emphasizing is it's given people who maybe have a traditional view of what teaching is an avenue to realize that there's a lot more that you can do and it doesn't all rest on you controlling everything. Anand Agarwal, who uh, was the uh, sort of one of the founding groups within edX, I remember years ago in probably 2012 or 2013, he did an interview and he talked about these discussion forums, like the students answer one another's questions, like you don't have to answer them all for them. And, and for, for you and for people who've been playing in the technology space since the late 90s, early 2000s, you've experienced that value of unleashing students creativity and an interesting thing happens when you give students the ability to control is they actually make you a better teacher because it as they answer one another's questions you're able to sort of find ways to engage and you know increase that latent potential so i i fully agree with you i think what what people who come back into the classroom are going to be more aware more flexible uh, of the opportunities that network technologies enable students to teach one another. And further to that, I've also had a, several conversations with very large, we'll call them government groups, and where the argument, what do you think those multiple choice tests are actually doing? Is actually landing in a way it has never landed in my career because suddenly we can't do them. Like anybody who knows anything about how the proctoring software works, it's unethical and it's ineffective. I mean, unethical and ineffective is a pretty bad combination. Uh, oh, it's also expensive. <laughs> so, so unethical, ineffective and expensive. Like maybe you shouldn't do that thing. Um, and so given that, the conversation, hey, what if we redesigned our courses so they were fun and so that you actually develop projects that you're interested in 
rather than spending the last four weeks of those course memorizing your way to a multiple choice exam. Like that four weeks of desperately trying to memorize your way to a multiple choice exam is not what I consider to be effective use of time. Yeah. yeah. You may disagree, but I'm finding that conversation is landing now in a way that it never has. Well, yeah. So, and I think what I've seen very much in line with what, what you're saying, and I know you're working more directly with faculty in, in, in a known institution than, than I am. Yeah. And so you're seeing that firsthand within an organizational culture, how faculty are responding. One of the things that I've seen that's been interesting is how universities are starting to rethink many of the core routines that are, they're there. We, we know they maybe don't make sense, but we all do them and it's tough to take a system that is at a point of rest and move it. So for example, standardized uh, testing or entry level exams that are being done in, in, in up until now in many systems, at least in the US. You know, a lot of these SAT and related uh, programs are, are under pressure. And when a university abandons them, even for a semester or for one enrollment cycle, I don't know if they're going to go back. And if they do go back, how much they will. So it's really, there's a lot of habits that the university has accumulated that we've seen a break from it. And I think it'll change at a systems level. Another one I just saw this week was a couple of colleges are starting to think about how are we going to enter the fall semester? The chance of full resumption of physical place-based learning, I don't think is terribly high, but they're saying, you know what, we'll split it. We'll do, instead of doing you know, a 16 week cycle, we'll do two months of two or three courses. And then it'd be intensive. So instead of splitting it over 16 weeks, you're gonna have, a, you'll go hard in these two areas. So you're, you're not gonna have a semester that runs horizontally, you're gonna have semesters that run vertically. So you'll do yep. September, October, you'll knock out two complete courses. Then yep. starting October into November, you'll knock out another two courses. So just in case the first cycle is done, you can move into the second one. So I think what we're going to see is uh, an interesting positive impact where a lot of our practices are going to be assessed and reevaluated and changed. And pedagogy advocates have been, there are a lot of people who've been arguing for that model for higher ed for years, simply because the cognitive load is lower. So if you're able to have one course for three weeks and then one course for three weeks and then one course for three weeks, there are opportunities there to dig into the material in ways that you can't otherwise. Now, there's the flip side where you can actually customize or acculturate yourself to a certain field of knowledge that can also be a challenge there. But I would say one of the big advantages to what you're talking about is not the change itself, but the ways in which trying to do that forces people to understand how universities actually work. So I've been in those conversations in my institution and elsewhere, more elsewhere. Um, but every time somebody brings it up, I go, okay, so what are we gonna do about residences? And what are we going to do about uh, breaks? And what are we going to do about how the books get purchased? And what are we going to do? And it forces you to open up the, the whole sort of the, the whole box of higher ed and look inside and go, oh, this isn't just about faculty teaching students in classrooms. There's like, how do the labs get scheduled? Do we need those labs anyway? Like all those pieces. And it forces people to sort of, I hesitate to use this word, but professionalize themselves with regard to their feeling about higher education. I mean, you've been saying this for probably, I don't know, a hundred years now, that people need to look at higher ed as a system. And it's a, it's a very, it's a complex system and it's all interlinked. And people need to think of higher ed as a profession in a sense, or think of it professionally so that they can understand those systems. Is that a fair representation of what your position has been? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, because, uh, you know, the one way I've seen, I mean, you know, networks, this, these are, uh, you know, higher education is a network of networks and we're part of a system of systems. And I think the way a system differs from a network is a system is a network that has a legacy and a set of rules. And, uh, but under, under, underpinning it is still the network structure. Now, when these network structures are locked into place, such as we've had with accreditation, with entry level exams, with a uh, curricular model, you know, for teaching and the list goes on. Now, the way, start, the way that uh, faculty promotion works is the other big tension bar there. When you start oh, to, yeah, when you start to unlock it, that's when you start to see new affordances 
start to arise. Now, the difficulty here has been, and I've been impressed, quite honestly, at how quickly faculty have responded because we've had this long, slow revolution where faculty have kind of just not been paying attention. Most faculty, yeah, there have been a few. We've talked about a lot of these during the, just the discussions in this course, but a lot of them are just small, iterative stages that, that oh, now we're gonna have an LMS, now we're gonna have lecture capture, now we're gonna have quizzing, now we're gonna do uh, whatever uh, type of tool in our classroom. So it's been slow. Nobody's really st stood up and said, no, this isn't working, this has this impact. There's been small, groups, small camps, I shouldn't say nobody, but small number of people, you and, and many others in, in sort of the ed tech space have stood up and said, these are the power implications of this, this doesn't work. But the majority of faculty have just kind of ignored it. And then somebody comes by and says, now you need to use Canvas and they use Canvas, but without sort of responding to it. What's happened now though, is everybody has been sort of jolted awake and there's been a heightened conversation that we're having right now that we should have been having in early 2000s as technology started creeping into the classroom. But now all of a sudden you have tenured faculty, notable faculty asking questions about teaching. And like you said, proctoring, multiple choice exams, do these things work? Is this the right way? So even though we have an interesting structure going on where there's a lot of startups and a lot of ed tech companies bombarding everybody's inbox on a daily basis. I'm sure you're getting these, but there's also a lot of faculty who are saying, wait a second, you know, what is teaching and what is the affordance of the online space? So I see that as a positive, even though this struggle is, is uh, not nearly over. In fact, it's barely begun because the economics of it are going to drive that. I'm going to keep up my Q&A of George Siemens here while I've got the chance. So one of the things that I've been arguing in my classroom here in the last couple of weeks, classroom, is that our universities have created an artificial scarcity environment where we have walled ourselves off from the abundance of information that our society has become. And that one of the things that's happened in the last five or six weeks is that scarcity bubble has evaporated because it was held together by the bricks and mortar that we were surrounded in inside of our classrooms. And now that that's gone away, it's much, much harder to, to apply that enforced scarcity, which is basically what a proctoring system is, right? It's a, it's a method of enforcing scarcity. And so the argument now that I've been making, and, and, and again, I probably learned this argument from you 15 years ago, is you're designing, there's no sense continuing to design for scarcity because it's not the world we live in anyway. So to me, I'm also feeling that argument land better than it ever has. Yeah, I find this interesting, maybe because of you know, my, your background uh, and affiliation in the Canadian context with systems like Athabasca, we've never had that aggressive like SAT testing model that determines which universities you go to. And I try to explain it to you know, someone in the States when I'm like, yeah, well, like if you go to, if you're in Edmonton and you go to University of Alberta, because it's the university that's there. And, you know, it's like, what, like, you know, you don't, you apply to 15 universities and then you select the one where, you know, that accepts your, your, uh, your SATs or where you're qualified. And I'm like, no, it's like, you're here, you go there. Yeah. You might go to another province, but the climate isn't nearly that intense or that aggressive. And so with that as a background, uh, the Canadian influence, and then having spent many years at Athabasca University and having affiliation with the Open University, Robin Mason, who was my original PhD supervisor, she unfortunately passed away. And, and, um, and then I, I, was, I dealt with uh, our mutual friend, Martin Weller. Uh, one of the outcomes of that experience is these systems don't preclude people from participating. I think it's almost, it's, it's interesting to see in, in mid 2000s, this was prominent. It was Encyclopedia Britannica put structures around knowledge because they say only experts know what's valid. And many of us at the time were saying a network can also determine a type of validity that can, yeah. that is now being done by experts. And in fact, in many cases it can do it better as Wikipedia taught us at the time. The same holds true with learning online. It's like a group of people who are motivated can teach each other an awful lot. That's you know the power and the value of networks. When you have governance systems that allow social contracts for negotiating knowledge and for determining what's valid and what's not. We see it in near real time in many news things coming up, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so what is relevant for us then is online 
and education in general, there's no reason why there should be an obstacle. Like, I think you should say, let everyone in. You apply, you're in. Let your performance determine if you stay, right? I, I think, I, and that's the open university model, is there's, you don't pre-exclude people based on grades they had when they were, you know, a 17-year-old confused kid in university. You let them in, and then you let them succeed based on their ability to achieve in the system rather than some pre-configured constraints. Well, one of the deconstructions that I've been trying to work with with folks is that the critique of the network learning model is that it creates an echo chamber amongst people who are working together. The counter argument to that is, don't tell me that a face-to-face -face classroom with one faculty member who has power is not an echo chamber. It's, it's by default an echo chamber. There's only one voice. And if that voice has an expectation that the things that they believe about their field are true, then it's only an echo chamber. So the example that I've been using around uh, Michael Caulfield's conception of a choral definition is that when I talk about how millennials work inside of digital spaces, I have to include the term digital native, not because I think it's true, because the people who I'm trying to work with are going to encounter the term because it's used by tons and tons and tons of people. And it's part of the definition of how they do it. I think it's a bad part of that definition, but you still can't be in this conversation and not like, I can't have that conversation, not have people say, I'm not a digital native. I'm not able to do this. Stop bothering me. Right. That always comes up. So it has to be part of the choral definition. And to me, that network to definition allows you to get outside of the echo chamber and include those voices and leave them as part of the overall structure, which, again, I'm hearing people like actually respond to because, like you say, they've been shaken out of their comfort space. And then maybe they heard before. Or maybe they're like, yeah, well, maybe he's right. But what does it matter to me? Whereas now suddenly it matters to me because I got to do this thing. I think so, it's really exciting. So yeah, and, and I, I would agree. So what, if I'm catching correctly what you're saying, you're, you're suggesting in spite of all the chaos and there's some of the economic lunacy that we're going to be facing, mm -hmm. which we talked about totally. earlier, but in spite of that, you're saying that you're, you're seeing really positive indicators from the people that actually do the teaching in the classrooms yeah. that there's a shift to sort of network digital pedagogies that are going to have a long-term positive impact. And that shift is the same as I'm hearing from government agencies. That's the thing that's weird to me is that I'm hearing the same willingness from both the gigantic agencies and the, I mean, we've got, you just look at Alex Usher's attempt here in Canada to uh, create some kind of national uh, online textbook thing right? Or however you want to interpret it. My first response is, yeah, we tried that. But then I'm thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, but we tried it before this time happened. And when I think about now, and I think about having like a nonprofit agency give somebody pile some money to do this. And I think, well, you know, Bryce managed to do this. We could take another try at it because I think the context is actually different right now. I think the environment is different. I think there's a lot of people who are part of the old guard who are going to go, yeah, well, we tried that and you can't do it. Yeah. But, and I, I'm, but I think practically speaking, it's always made sense. It's never made any sense for us to all have different first year physics textbooks. Like that has never made any sense. I, I fully agree because when you think of it, the, you know, a, 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 an idea that's early is often as bad as an idea that's wrong. Because when you, th and, and it's, it's interesting to see. i heard that before. 2004, it's like we're revisiting many of the ideas that were expressed at that time at the early stages of the open education movement. You know, this is when, you know, David Wiley and uh, MIT and a group of others were starting to promote, you know, open educational resources. There was discussions about increasing access opportunities. There was discussions about shifting expertise to the network and the list goes on. So what I've found fascinating to observe is that we're revisiting ideas that maybe were a bit premature, yeah. but that actually, made sense logically, even if they didn't make sense systemically. And now the system is able to absorb them. Also, I don't think you spoke with the system knowledge in 2004 that you speak with now. I don't think any of us speak in the same way that we did then. I think when you look at the people that I hear now taking up this conversation, they are people who maybe have a little less, they're a little less driven by the idealism of the process and a little bit more driven by a fuller understanding of the field. That's certainly true for me. Because when I look back at the stuff that I wrote 15 years ago about this, it's like, that was never gonna work. 
You know, and I mean, here's the difference. So the idea was right, though. That's, I think, the difference is well, some of the it. idea remains right. Network learning, collective expertise, social contracts for negotiating, whatever it is that you're dealing with, yeah. uh, active engagement from students as part of the teaching process. The list goes on like those ideas still make sense. They always did. I would call it workforce prep now. Um, yeah, right. Exactly. Like I, I would I would use different language. And I mean, I've made that argument before where you're like, you know, call it workforce prep, but nobody is going into their job and being asked a question and being asked to memorize it and give the answer the next day. Yeah. That is not a thing that's happening in people's jobs. What's happening is their boss looks at them and go, go figure this shit out and then come back with an answer for me. Yeah. Not, I'm not going to tell you whether the answer is even right. I need you to do that. Yeah. Right. And, that's and that's the reality. Call it, yeah, like I said, call it whatever you want to call it. The idea was right. The system didn't like it because it didn't understand it. The system is receptive now because it's changing. So I'm going to slightly aggregate things up. And there's long been a focus, and you mentioned this, that do we need in a small country like Canada, you know, a hundred first year intro to psychology courses. So what happens at a systems level? Like, do you think there's a receptivity? for universities to reach across the aisle and to collaborate. I, I fully expect that some state level systems in the US are gonna have a top-down mandate that's going to say when a system like Michigan is short a billion dollars, there's gonna be deep structural change. So do you think you know, our university is gonna reach across the aisle and collaborate or is that a bridge too far? I mean, the other option is K-14, right? Um, and just, totally take over the first two years. Um, and whether that happens inside the universities or not, I mean, here in Ontario, there used to be a, thir a grade 13 as part of this process that ostensibly prepared students to be a little bit more ready whenever they hit the more complex end of the university system. So I think there are some, our first year university, uh, first year large class university experience anywhere in the world right now is not knocking anybody's socks off. Are there uh, boutique universities that maybe are in situations? Sure. But overall, nobody is walking into a 1700 person first year class and going, woohoo, like that's not happening. So the difference between 1700 and 17,000, practically, I don't think it's a problem. The logistics of it, like how do we get the, a set, like the, grade that somebody got sent over and what happens when there's an appeal and all those things that requires a government agency that you'd have to stand up something brand new. Like we have, uh, we have in Ontario, you apply centrally. So this central application system that you go into and then choose your university once you're inside of it. So that application process has been provincialized. And I mean, in Canada, it would have to be provincial. There's no, there's no, there is no national education, anything. Yeah. It's like even impossible. in the United States, there's a department of education, at least we don't even have that. Yeah. Like it just doesn't exist. So there'd be no way to do it because I don't think a bunch of folks who have, who are well-meaning are going to be able to create policy on a national level in Canada. There is an agency in the United States to do it. And yeah. actually weird to say maybe, but maybe easier in the United States than it would be here, uh, well, but certainly right. provincially, why not? But in the U.S., one of the things, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with a company called Parchment, uh, which was one of the co-founders of uh, that other great educational tool called uh, Blackboard. And uh, <laughs> Parchment was an attempt to normalize or to at least give transcripts the same language. Because you can do transcripts across the, the uh, U.S. setting, if you will, literally within similar districts, you won't get credit transfer. You will have taken an intro to psychology course, but you transfer to a new university and you're not going to get a credit for that intro to psychology course because they, don't, they haven't found a way to make that communication happen. So one of the goals with Parchment, and I haven't looked at them in about a year and a bit, so they, I'm not sure exactly how their, their current trajectory is, but I think they were up to like three or 500 employees at one time and their entire mandate was to let transcription services speak across transcription services. So, for example, this is an experience I had as a Canadian going into the U.S. higher education system. So I did my Ph.D. out of University of Aberdeen. Now, University of Aberdeen is, I don't know what their ranks, probably a top 150, top 200 university globally. I don't know the exact ranking, but it's, it's well known. Right. It's kind of like if I went to apply for a job at University of Ottawa and I had a Ph.D. from University of 
Calgary, you would just say, yeah, that's great. Come on in and work for us. Give us your actual transcript or your, your, your certificate so we know you have a PhD and you're not full of it. Come work. What happened in the U.S., though, is I actually had to go through, and it's not cheap, I had to go through a service that would go and validate my courses. They would validate the equivalency of the degree. They, and it was basically an interim agency that played a role of saying, yes, George, you actually have this degree, rather than me literally sending them the certificate that said, this is a university that you all know, it's higher ranked than the university I'm applying to, you all know, <laughs> but they don't accept it. So what I'm trying to wow. say is that's, that's the interesting thing in the US, I think it'll be a startup like Parchment or something else that's going to try and solve that problem because that's how the US operates. Mm. And then do you have, like, do you share your students out to get the course done over there so you don't have to do the online thing in your institution? And then where does the money go? Well, that, that'll be, that's going to be an interesting thing with, I, I, I'm not sure what this current setting will do for companies like Parchment that are trying to create a normalized credit transfer system, or at least a- Can we just put that on the blockchain? Put it on the blockchain. No, I think it's the future. I think that that's definitely where we need to go. So, and once you say blockchain, there's no better word on which to end our little discussion <laughs> than that. Anyway, it's as always, it's been a pleasure, Dave, uh, chatting Absolutely, with you. Absolutely, George. And Justin, um, take care of yourself, buddy. Are you done your uh, online learning in a hurry thing, by the way? Is that wrapping up or? Um, I'm, I'm taking a bit of a hiatus right now. I've got a number of, this course has kind of taken a fair amount out of me. So I'm running another section every week and we're just yeah. plowing through it. And I'm trying to uh, build resources around that to turn it into um, something that can run headless. So I'm trying to make sure that all of my blah, blah, blah time gets devoted to that. Yeah. Well, either way, sounds great. I mean, good that you're doing the, the work on, on, uh, on ground as well as the continuing to share your expertise in that. So take care all. Great to chat. Take See you, Dave. Everybody. See you later. <laughs>